Hi, this is Jim Janesey. We're going to take a very fun-filled look at a spreadsheet here. I don't mean to intimidate you with this. I'm going to give you some data that I've drawn from the Chicago Tribune and assembled for you here in the orange. What I'm giving you is a CSV file that has a heading row that looks something like this. And it has just three pieces of information in every row. The name of a company, the selling price of its shares of stock on March the 5th, and a value market capitalization, which just means how much people think the company is worth. This value comes about when you multiply this price per share times the number of shares that are outstanding. But the only two values that you're given by the newspaper are the selling price of the stock and how much the company is valued at in terms of market capitalization. Everything else you see on the sheet I've put into here with formulas and I'm going to demonstrate what the purpose of this whole thing is in just a minute. I just want to let you know though that what you have here is the 30 largest companies by way of this valuation, the 30 largest companies in Chicago. So this is just publicly available information about these companies. They're each publicly traded. That means their stocks are sold on the open uh, market and the stock exchange. And it's the market that sets the value here. So if some company, like Boeing, for example, recently was awarded a contract for aircraft uh, refueling tanker airplanes, that might have a very positive effect on their worth. So you'd see this value go up. That value times the number of shares outstanding is how this value is computed. But we can work backwards from that. If we take this value and divide it by this, we can come up with the number of shares. And that's what I'm kind of interested in. What is this quantity of shares? Is it really here 3 billion shares, each worth $45 for JP Morgan? Or for some other companies, for example, here this firm has very high stock price. They have 66 million shares out, so it leads to a market capitalization of $20 billion. Well, I'm no financial wizard. I really don't have any way of understanding what these values mean besides what I've just mentioned to you. But I do know something about Excel. I've used this for a number of years. I've trained a lot of people on it. And what I'm going to do is to show you how this whole thing works, first of all, what the point of it is. And then I'm going to show you how we work from that very basic data with just these three columns of information in it to arrive at all of this. Let me point out some of the features for you. Computations are done this way. Now what do you see in this cell here as a value? What's really in it is a formula. And this formula refers to locations on the spreadsheet. Each location is indicated by a column letter and a row number. So for example, in this formula, the value here is going to equal C4, that is the value C and 4, this number, divided by what's in B4, which is this number. So really this formula is telling us, take this $177 billion and divide it by 45.52 and put the resulting answer in this cell. And that's the number that comes up there. Now here's this formula. Take a look at up here. Let's look at the next row down. Same formula, slightly different indications of where the cells are located. It's one row down. We're in row 5. This is referring to columns B and C in row 5. And the very same thing here and here. And if I go down with the arrow key, you can see that very same thing is happening all the way throughout. I only had to write this formula once, and then I just copied it on down. And when I copy the formula, Excel is smart enough to adjust it for the row numbers. Having coded the formula once, I can get it into all the rows. That's how this column has been determined. It's been computed from these values. Now I've added here some other stuff just so that we can play with this and see what happens. This is the stock price on March the 5th. I've used that value in combination with this value to come up with the number of shares. I'm going to leave these values static in the orange area. What I'm going to do now, here's a column that says price now. And I'm kind of interested. 
in a couple of things related to this price and this price. Now, the data here is totally fictitious, so JP Morgan has not declined precipitously in value. I'm just playing with these numbers in the spreadsheet. I could plug any values in here. If, in fact, this $45 declined to $7, that's a pretty significant decline expressed as a value of dollars. It's this decrease, but as a percentage of decline, it's this number. And we'll take a look at what those formulas look like. This is another form of formula, and this is yet another one. You see, the, the formulas are rather simple. It's just that there's a lot of them. Now, the point here, for every row, I want to compute what the market capitalization is now based on this value times this value. And the answer is to be put here. So we have D5, in this case, times E5, this formula. And that formula is located here, and that's where the answer goes. Now I'm just going to fool around here for a second. I'm going to take and make this number, let's make it 100, just so that you can see this a little easier. $100 declines to $80 that's a 20% decline. And it happens also to be $20 decline. But let's put back the number that was there. You see something happening here in this whole area as I change these numbers. Let me demonstrate how that works. Supposing this number, which has gone from $48 down to 45 and let's suppose it continued to drop and it went to 30 Nothing has happened uh, because I haven't yet pressed the Enter key, but what I want you to see is in this area, what happens here with these numbers once I hit the Enter key here. Here I go. You've seen a bunch of numbers change here. In fact, let me just go back. I went back to the original value by using this to step back one step. Now if I go forward once again, reducing that 45 to 30, Watch those numbers in the upper right part of the spreadsheet. You see a lot of numbers change. That's because some other values here are based on this value being added up or averaged. This is recomputed, and then all the other cells are recomputed also. This is the magic of a spreadsheet. I can make one change here, and it has its effect on every total that includes this as a part of it. All that arithmetic is done automatically. It's done very rapidly as soon as I change this value. So once again, you see everything change. Now what I was out to do with this spreadsheet, aside from using it as a means of demonstrating things to you, was to show you a bunch of other things about Excel that could make you kind of a hero in the workplace because what I'm going to show you is the kind of things that most people have a problem with or they just simply avoid doing because it seems too complex and as a result their spreadsheets whenever they have to work with them are kind of amateurish and look a little dowdy. I've tried here in this series of tutorials to show you things that really are useful and important without being overwhelming in terms of the formulas or what's going on here. This entire spreadsheet is just as wide as the screen and it goes just a little bit lower. So it's not really overwhelming. Here's what we're going to be taking a look at. This number is formatted a certain way. This one doesn't have decimal points, but has commas in it, just as does this one. This one has a negative sign appearing and two decimal points, but we don't want a whole lot of zeros when the value is zero. So I've set the format up so that it doesn't obscure things with a bunch of trivia across the screen. Here's a very interesting feature. Notice the values in these cells are controlling the color in the cells. When there's no change, it's white. But when the change is positive, it's green. When it's negative, it's red. That's called conditional formatting. We're going to talk about that. Let me just demonstrate for you how that works. Here's a stock selling at 6109, and I said the price hasn't changed. Let's make the price go down to 60. Watch what happens over here as soon as I do this. 
because the value there is negative, it's declined 1.8%, it's lit up in red. Now that's very nice because that can highlight things for you. That's called conditional formatting. I'll show you how to do that. You'll notice here there's this horizontal line and this vertical line. We can apply those kinds of borders. In fact, I had forgotten to put it on here. It's rather simple to do. Let's just figure out the line color that we want. And then let's figure out the top border on those cells. And now we have that line there too. So I'll go over that with a little bit more emphasis. Notice that this top row here, some of the lettering is different size and different intensity and different color. I'll show you how to do that. How do we make this thing reorganize itself so that all the columns are only the width that they really need to be? That's an easy thing to do. We'll cover that with formatting also. Finally, I'm going to show you a little something to do with functions. Just a very simple one here. These are just ordinary divisions, but take a look at this line labeled average. You see the formula here has kind of a keyword in front and a range of cells. Here's some additional power of a spreadsheet. Various functions exist like average and maximum and minimum and various other things. In this range of cells I wanted a lot of work to be done. I wanted the cells to be added up and then divided by the number of cells and that value placed here. It's very easy to do an average. I could have also had Excel automatically pick out the highest or the lowest value or do some other operations on them. Even statistical operations are possible. But this is just a very simple one. You can understand average and I've also done an average here. I've put these totals at the top and I've right justified these two labels so that they stand apart from these values in a kind of a meaningful way but not over here to the left as they might otherwise stand if I hadn't formatted them. What I'm looking for here, I want these totals at the top, not at the bottom. This list may be very long. I don't want to have to scroll to the bottom of it every time I want to see these totals. So it's kind of a common practice to put these kind of totals up at the top where you can see them right away. That's a little different than you might do with a column of numbers, but it's just a practice with spreadsheets. With that little introduction, I'm going to conclude this overview of what we're doing with the spreadsheet. Just think about it this way. This is not a very complex thing to do, although it looks kind of hairy because it has a lot of rows. If it had fewer rows, it probably wouldn't look as complex, but the example wouldn't be as good. We're going to start with the simple data in the orange, and step by step, in the next couple of short videos, I'm going to show you how this kind of a functional spreadsheet evolves from just the original data that we loaded in. And this, I think, is a fairly painless way for you to learn enough about Excel quickly to be useful to people in the workplace.